There's a sutta where the Buddha says there are two things that give rise to discernment. One is appropriate attention, and the other is the voice of another person. That second factor is probably most obvious in the other suttas where we hear that the Buddha was teaching somebody as they were meditating, and at the end of his discourse they gained awakening. Because basically his voice, or the, what he was saying, was telling them to look at things with appropriate attention, ask, helping them to ask the right questions, sparking appropriate attention in their minds. Of course, appropriate attention is learning how to see things in terms of Four Noble Truths, seeing where there's suffering, where there's the craving in the mind that causes the suffering, so you let go of it. In other words, looking at everything in terms of the question of suffering and the end of suffering, stress and the end of stress. And those are terms that we rarely use in our lives. Most of us are more in our narratives. This happened, that happened, and then this person did this, or then I did that, and then you did that. And or he or she did that. Or the things that we want to do at the end of the meditation session, whatever, the other issues that we get involved in. And it's very rare that we just look at things purely in terms of where there's suffering, where there's the cause of suffering, what qualities we can develop to bring the end of suffering about. So we have to gain practice in thinking in those ways. It's interesting that in that particular passage the Buddha doesn't mention concentration at all. In other passages he talks about concentration as a prerequisite for discernment. But always in the list of factors there, appropriate attention has to find its place someplace, whether it's prior to the concentration or immediately together with the concentration. There has to be the ability to ask those questions, otherwise the concentration just sits there. Or even worse, while you're sitting in meditation you ask yourself the wrong, ask yourself the wrong questions and you can get spinning off into all kinds of theories. There's that sutta where the Buddha talks about the basis for sixty, two different kinds of wrong view. And many times it comes from people sitting and meditating and weird things come up in their meditation. They might get a state of concentration and reflect back on their previous lifetimes if they can remember them. And because they only reflect back one or two lifetimes, they get a very limited idea of what happened. And then they based a lot of theories on that. So the concentration itself is no guarantee that you're going to get wisdom. It has to come together with other properties. After all, there are eight factors in the path. Right view is right there at the beginning. So it's good that we reflect on right view, get used to thinking in terms of right view, so that when concentration does come, it has the background it needs to give rise to the discernment we're looking for. There are two levels of right view. One is mundane. <clears throat> which starts with the principle of karma, and also it includes the, the conviction that there are people who have gone to the end of suffering, and they, when they teach they know what they're talking about. That gives us the conviction that we're on the right path, and it's not a groping around in the dark. But again, their teaching focuses back on what we're doing right now. It's our karma, looking at what we and we ourselves have done and not done, getting very sensitive to our own actions. This is why the Buddha's very first teaching to Rahula, once he'd established the principle of truthfulness, was the principle of looking at your actions, seeing the results that they get. Focusing on your actions here in the present moment. Learning the principle of cause and effect right there. It 
And it's interesting to note that the other passages of Dharma teachings aimed at young people keep focusing on this issue of cause and effect, be very sensitive to cause and effect. There's that series of questions for the novices. It's kind of like a catechism. What is one? What is two? What is three? What is four? And with four, you know, they're the four noble truths, fives, sixes are the six sense bases, fives are the five khandhas. Number one is interesting, though. What is one? All beings subsist on food. A very basic way of teaching causality to young kids that if you don't have food, you can't live. There's a cause and effect relationship. It also takes a particularly interesting take on cause and effect, the act of eating. As you get deeper into the teachings, you realize this, this act of eating is in and of itself suffering, the fact that you have to depend on these things when you reflect on the requisites. You realize how much work goes into simply the fact that you get food to keep your body going. If you don't get the food, you die. It's like you're born with this big gaping need right here. Then you have to keep looking after, looking after, looking after it. And how are you going to do it in such a way that you're not imposing more than is necessary on others. So again, the issue is cause and effect and what you're doing in the midst of this process of cause and effect. This is helpful in two ways in the concentration. One, it keeps you focused on the fact that if you're going to get your mind concentrated, it depends on you, on your own actions. But also, once the concentration is there, it keeps you focused on what you're doing. Years back in Thailand, there was a woman who came and was meditating at the, up in the jetty on the hill on what Thomas did. And as she was meditating, this vision of a gold platter came. And she actually reached out and tried to grab the gold platter. Of course, that pulled her out of concentration. What happened there was that she lost sense of what she was doing, fo totally focused on the platter, without thinking about what she was doing to grab it. Wasn't paying any attention to the craving that came up in her own mind. She was focused more on the platter. But the teachings of right view, the teachings of appropriate attention, would focus you back on what you're doing, how you're reacting to things. Try to get more and more sensitive to that, realizing that there is a cause and effect pattern here, and what you're doing is the major factor in that cause and effect pattern, so you better be sensitive to it, clear about it. And when you're focused in this way, then as the mind gets into concentration, you begin to notice things that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And when it comes out of concentration, you notice things, how the mind zips out. There's almost a physical sensation of flowing as you leave the breath and your attention goes out and inhabits it, the world outside. While you're in concentration, there can also be a very subtle sensitivity to what you're doing to maintain the concentration. If you keep yourself focused here, then it's a lot more likely that discernment will arise. You begin to catch yourself doing things that you didn't notice before. In the way you focus, in the way you frame issues, the way you make decisions. It's in seeing these things that discernment arises. You catch yourself doing things you didn't see. This is very, very important. Because we're doing these things all the time, all the things that are the Buddha talks about as causes of suffering. Intention is buried way down in there, and it's our intentions that we tend to cover up, and that the whole process of concentration is meant to open up to ourselves. 
It's an important part of the practice. It's not just getting the mind still, but also learning how to, where you should focus your attention. It's on this doing part of the mind. Be clear about what it's doing as it's focusing in and gaining concentration, how you can get the mind to settle down, how you can learn how to be feel good with a breath. Be sensitive to various ways that you squeeze the breath simply when you're in the act of focusing. Sometimes the way you focus <laughs> creates pressure on the breath. Well, the way you focus tends to block out areas of your awareness. And then you notice what you can do to compensate for that. And as you get more and more sensitive to the fact that what you're doing is shaping your experience, you're looking directly in the area where insight can arise. So concentration, even though it's listed as a cause of discernment, isn't sufficient. You can't trust that everything comes into your mind when it's quiet is going to be discernment. It has to be framed with the right questions. You have to learn how where to focus, and this is what the questions do, is they focus your attentions in the right spot. And it's also useful for testing your insights when they arise. Because once something appears to you in the meditation, you, you can't just take it as the truth right then and there. You have to Put a little question mark beside it and say, I've got to test this. This is what helps protect you from your insights. And we're here looking for insight, but then sometimes when they come, they may not be genuine insights. And you can't know until you've tested them. Some, of course, will be obvious when, you, when they spring up, but others are not so obvious. So you've got to be careful. And again, it's a question, if you, take, if you follow this particular insight and act on it, what happens as a result? And as you develop this quality, looking at cause and effect, using appropriate attention, you become more and more independent as a, as a meditator. You can rely more and more on yourself, so that you develop within the mind all the factors, all the factors that you really need for insight to be truly liberating, truly trustworthy, something you can depend on. <clears throat>